Hi all, uh, Warren Toomey here and welcome back to another video in my crazy small computer video series. Um, what I've done is I've taken my version 1 of my crazy small CPU and I've pulled all the wires out mainly because I wanted to spread the chips out a bit more evenly across the three breadboards and it also gives me a chance to wire it up to be version 2 of the CPU. Uh, it looks beautiful at the moment without all the wires uh, but I'm sure as we progress it's going to get messier. Uh, it also gives me a chance to, as I rewire it up, to explain all the different components and how they work. Um, my uh, printer is a bit out of ink, so I'm going to go back to version 1 of the diagram and annotate it. So back in version 1, we had the A register uh, attached to the multiplexer, but the B register was connected to the data bus. So version 2, we're going to take that out. We're going to wire up the B register also to the multiplexer. Um, that allows us to do uh, both loading the A register with a constant uh, from the address ROM. Uh, also, if we now load the B register from the same place. And one more thing, uh, we can now use one of the uh, control lines from the uh, top ROM as an extra bit into the ALU, and that gives us 16 ALU operations. All right, um, what I want to do today is spend a bit of time talking about how the ALU works. And um, of course the ALU, the um, arithmetic and logic unit, is the heart of the CPU. It's the thing that does adds and subtracts, um, shifts, uh, ands and ors, and those sorts of things. All right, so what do you actually want if you're going to build an ALU? All right, and of course um, our computers are 4-bit ALU, but the same thing goes pretty much for all ALUs. Well, you basically need two inputs. So let's call our inputs B and A. And on those two inputs we need some sort of operation to be performed. So let's say operation. And when the operation is performed we need some sort of result. Well this is a 4-bit ALU that I'm building so we're going to need 4, bit, uh, four bits wide for the B input and 4 bits wide for the A input. And I want 16 operations so another 4 bits of inputs for the uh, operation. So when we do A plus B, 4 bits plus 4 bits, we're going to expect to get a 4-bit output. Um, something else that's useful to come out of an ALU is the flags to tell us whether we've had a zero result or negative result or whether there's been some sort of carry. So let's bring out another four lines and we're going to produce a negative, zero, overflow and carry. And I'm going to call those the flags bits. All right, now, uh, nearly all done. One of the nice things about bringing out the carry is that once we've done a 4-bit add, and if there's a carry, then we can pass it back into the ALU, and we can do another set of 4-bits add, and that way we can do 8-bit addition, 12-bit addition, 16-bit addition. We just keep rippling the carry up. So we also really need a carry in. All right, now, the ALU is... A combinatorial circuit. Uh, there's no state that it needs to hold. There's no. We don't need a clock signal to tell it to transition from one state to another. So we can get away with a standard old ROM. All right. So I'm going to use an 8K by 8 ROM. Uh, let me just see what I've got. It's an 828C64B, and here's the uh, pinout. So you can see we've actually got. Um, address lines 0 up to 12, we've got data output lines 0 up to 7, and we've got a bunch of other lines which I'll probably talk about a bit later when we get on to dealing with the control signals. Okay, so let's see how we convert this into, see if I can move that up so you can see it, both of them. Alright, so um, 0 to 3 is going to be the B lines, 0 to 3 are the address lines coming in for the B value, uh, 4 to 7 are going to be holding the value for A. Uh, we've got our operation. Now you would expect to have 8, 9, 10, 11, but let me just put down 8 to 10 here. Carry in is going to be 11 for historical reasons, and that means our fourth ALU operation bit is actually going to be address line 12. Now you might say, well, why the heck didn't I just go 8 to uh, 11 there and have 12 for my carry in? Well, back when I was doing version 1, I only had three uh, address lines uh, for my operation, so there's only eight 
uh, ALU operations. Um, and Carrion came in on 11. And so now that I've got uh, four bits, I just happened to use the next available address bit, which was address uh, bit 12. All right, so there's our ALU. Um, the output uh, is uh, the result, and that goes out on uh, IO lines four to seven, and the flags go out on lines zero to three. All right, so we can use a standard old ROM chip uh, to do this, uh, which just means is basically instead of actually doing calculations like full adders and full subtractors and barrel shifts and all that sort of thing, um, we're just going to look up the result. So what that actually does mean is that we have to program our ALU. So if I go back to version 2 with the uh, chips laid out a bit more evenly, uh, I've got to now pull out my ALU chip because well, what I want to do now is program it. All right, so let me just lever it out. You'll notice that this one's not in a zip socket. Uh, that's because I don't intend to pull it out terribly often. Uh, and maybe I should try a different implement. Let's go for the knife. Cut. Oh, I shouldn't do that. All right, got it out. What I'm now going to do is pop it into a ROM uh, programmer. And once I program it, I'm going to put it back into the breadboard and it shouldn't move after that. On the other hand, the uh, two ROMs that are going to have the program in them, I've got them in ZIF uh, sockets so that I can much more easily get them in and out. All right, let's go and have a look at programming the ALU. Okay, now here's my mini pro ROM programmer and my ALU ROM ready to go. I'm going to just pop that into uh, the top and lock it in and go back over to my laptop. Okay, over here on my laptop um, I've got my software for the crazy small CPU version 2. Um, I've got a program called, where is it, uh, Gen ALU, which is going to be the thing that generates um, the contents of the ROM. So what it's going to do is actually run addition, subtraction, ands and ors, and exclusive ors, and all of that sort of thing, and produce the actual ROM image. So if I say make alu.rom, we can now see that we have two ROM images. Um, alu.rom is for Logisim, so if you actually want to simulate this using Logisim, we can use that as the ROM. Uh, but the actual binary ROM we're going to write to the real chip is alu.img. So I've got an alias, uh, which is going to use uh, the open source MiniPro software and write it out to my chip. So hopefully I can say wrromalu.image and it spits it out and verification, verification OK. So that means um, I now have an ALU over there on my ROM chip. All right, welcome back. I've put the ROM back into its socket and I've added a whole heap of patch wires, so it now looks hideous. Um, but what I'm just going to quickly do is uh, power it up. And the first thing you'll notice is I've got the triple five, uh, 556 timer running. I'm not using it at the moment. So I've got the stable side, uh, pretty much the same as Ben Eder's video series and the mono stable side. Oh, that light's probably a bit annoying, so I'll pull it out. So what we've got over here is the ALU with some LEDs and some patch lines so I can change the values. I've got I've got four LEDs for the A register, four LEDs for the B register, so those are the two inputs to the ALU. I've got four LEDs for the ALU operation and four LEDs for the 4-bit output and four LEDs for the negative zero overflow and carry bits. All right, now I did forget to tell you actually what the ALU operations are. So here's a list. And remember I started off with eight and now I've got effectively two sets of eight because I've now got one, two, three, four, one, two, oh, sorry, one, two, three, four bits of ALU operations. So I've got um, addition and subtraction binary I've also got addition and subtraction decimal, so that allows me to do binary uh, coded decimal operations, and I'll use that to great advantage when I'm doing my Fibonacci calculation. So I can do one column of decimals, take the carry and bring it over to the next column, and I can just ripple up that decimal carry and do carry addition, which is great. Um, we've got the usual ones, and ex or exclusive or. Um, I've got an ALU operation that takes the value of A and simply increments it. So we can do things like plus plus 
uh, in high level languages by doing that. Uh, we've got one that output zero. Um, I probably don't need that, um, but I had a spare ALU operation, so I popped it in. Um, it's useful sometimes to pass the value of A out. So for example, if I want to transfer the A register into the B register, then I can pass A through the ALU, comes out on the output, and I can load that into the B register. So we've got pass A and pass B operations. Um, in the latest version, version 2, I've added some multiply, 4-bit by 4-bit multiply. Now, of course, when you do 4-bit by 4-bit multiply, the result can be up to 8 bits wide. So I've got the low 8 bits um, by doing the low operation and the high 8 bits there as well. I've got a 4-bit division and a 4-bit modulo as well. Um, what I'm just going to quickly do is show off the add operation. So you can see already I've got 0, 0, 0, 1. In fact, this is backwards, so I've got 8 as my operation and we'll be doing binary add. At the moment we've got nothing coming in on the A register, so that's those wires, nothing coming in on the B register, those are those four wires, and the result at the moment is zero. And of course the flags are showing negative zero, the zero bit is turned on, so we know that it's actually doing the right thing. So let's take the B value and turn it into one. All right, so 1 plus 0 is 1, and it's no longer uh, negative, it's not negative, it's not 0, and we haven't produced any carries. So let's add some other numbers, so let's make the A value 4. Okay, so 0, 0, 1, 0, so that's 4, plus 1 is 5, 4 plus 1 is 5. Again, it's not negative, it's not 0. Alright, so what can we do next? Let's make this... Um, let's make this 7. If I can get it in, there we go. Okay, so 7 plus 1 is the number 8. But that's the most significant bit, so as soon as we turn on the most significant bit, we've actually got a negative value. So in fact, that's really not positive 8, because if we're doing signed arithmetic, then that's actually negative 8. So we've gone 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and we've, over, uh, we've wrapped around to come back to negative 8. All right, so that's why the negative bit on the flags is on. And you'll also notice that the carry bit is, oh, sorry, the overflow bit is on. And that's because this was a positive number, positive 7. This was a positive number, positive 1. But the output is now a different sign. So and that's letting us know that the output has got a different sign than the two inputs. All right, what else can we do? Let's just quickly try something like, let's pop this to be positive or to be negative. So now what have we got? Uh, 9 plus 7 should be 16. All right, so we've actually got the number 0, which of course is 16. But now we've got negative 0, so that's indicating that's 0, overflow and carry. So now we've actually got uh, a bit past the left-hand side of the four output bits, indicating that, in fact, that's bigger than we can fit into a four-bit result. And that carry flag we can eventually store in the flags register, the one that hasn't got the label, it fell off. And then later on, if we wanted to ripple that carry up to the next group of four bits, we could use that carry as well. Excellent. So it does look like the ALU is working. And of course, all of these messy wires are just here for testing. So I won't go through all of the other 15 ALU operations. Uh, but anyway, it looks like the ALU is working. Next video, hopefully I'll have wired up the A and B registers into the ALU and will hopefully show that the, these two registers can take a value and then pass it into the ALU. All right, thanks a lot, and I'll catch you on the next video.